Hey, aloha and welcome to Stan Energy Man. I'm Stan Osterman from Retirement. I used to be from HCAT, now I'm just from Retirement. Coming to you live and direct from the Big Island. We're at uh, Blue Planet Research here in Purubava. It's about halfway between Kona and Waimea for those of you who are geographically handicapped. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful, beautiful place, about 2,600 feet above sea level. Nice and cool and really, really pretty. Getting a little bit more rain than usual. First of all, I'd like to thank everybody that came to my retirement party last Wednesday. That was a really good, good fun time. And I really appreciate all the support that, I've been, that I had when I was an HCAT and all the folks that showed up, it was, it was really great. But today's show is really special. I've been asking Paul if we could do a show from uh, Poovava here and Blue Planet Research, because it's a beautiful lab. He's an architect, he designed it. And uh, we could also call him Pastor Paul because He's the pastor of the church of the first element. So their motto is God's a gas. And uh, it's all about hydrogen, of course. So anyway, Paul, welcome to the show. Thanks for being with us. <laughs> Hi, Sam. It's a pleasure as always. Thanks for having me. Hey, we had, a, we had a really cool background setup. We're actually in front of the lunar mission control setup that uh, Blue Planet uses uh, to control the habitat that they have on Mauna Loa. Um, to train uh, not, not only NASA astronauts, but international uh, astronauts um, on lunar habitat. And the, the habitat is actually a little microcosm of the system that they have set up here on the ranch, uh, which has been off the grid for, I think, about five, maybe going on six years now. Almost right? seven now. Wow, almost seven years. Yeah. So it's a really outstanding example of uh, how to do sustainable uh, energy and how to uh, use hydrogen in the mix for your long-term storage. And uh, it's the place that I always love to bring people uh, to show them. And Paul's a, a great host. So, Paul, give us a little bit of your background and how you got to work here at Blue Planet. Yeah, so my background, as you mentioned earlier, is architecture. And I met Hank Rogers um, in, in the realm of architecture, uh, came over to do some projects for him on the Big Island. We got into energy at some point, and I felt like energy was more interesting at the time. Uh, it fit into architecture as well. So I kind of did a transition from doing just architecture into doing more renewable energy. So I like to tell people that I'm, I'm a recovering architect and now doing a lot more electrical engineering. And uh, as, as, as Stan, I'm a, a devotee of hydrogen and want to promote hydrogen infrastructure, not only in Hawaii, but for the whole world. So Paul's, uh, one of Paul's projects recently um, with Blue Planet Research is to build a, they call it a power cube, and it's an eight foot by eight foot by eight foot connex, a small connex, the smallest they make. Um, military uses that a lot, that size um, module for a lot of their equipment. But what makes this thing interesting is um, it's built to be like an emergency power pack in a box. And that's what we're going to let Paul describe today. He's got some images. He's got uh, all the details, facts, and figures on it. But they just deployed it to the mainland to a little event that they, you might have heard of called Burning Man. And uh, apparently it was a pretty big hit over there. So take it away, Paul. Sure, sure. So um, just, just as a side note, uh, in Blue Planet Research, we have kind of a little subgroup, uh, kind of like a skunk works. But since we're in Hawaii, it's more of a mongoose works. So we have a, a small group of people who work on special projects. And the cube was one of those projects that came up in discussion. And we thought, well, if we could knock out a prototype really quickly, we could take it to Burning Man for 2019 and test it in probably the harshest conditions known to man. So besides the very alkaline dust that's 10 times finer than talcum power powder. They have uh, complete whiteouts with dust storms, high temperatures, and all kinds of crazy loads. So we're gonna look at some pictures of it actually performing at Burning Man. This is before it left the ranch. And basically, as you said earlier, it's a complete system in a box. All of the solar panels, all of the support structure, all of the batteries, the PCS electronics, Everything fits inside of this eight foot cube. And it, the intent is to be able to deliver this to a disaster site 
fully charged. You can hit the ground, power things up within minutes, and within two hours have all of the solar panels deployed and doing its charging. So it was truly a, a solution for emergency disasters. And if we'd have had this when Puerto Rico first got hit and now the Bahamas, this would have made a significant difference. So let's put that image back up, Robert. And I wanted to show, uh, have Paul go actually to some of the components in there. Uh, on the left side, what's that stuff on the left, Paul? So on the left side, we have our inverters uh, on the wall at the top. Also the electronics cabinet, which contains all of the control system or SCADA, which is all powered by a program called EMC. Uh, EMC is a, a type of supervisory uh, control and data acquisition. Uh, it's what we use at the Mars habitat and the lunar habitat to run all the systems there. It also runs the ranch here at Pugavava, Blue Planet Research. And on the bottom are uh, the battery banks. So there's 50 kilowatt hours worth of energy storage and batteries. And of course, this is lithium ferrous phosphate. We don't do cobalt. Uh, cobalt has too many thermal management issues. And since this is in a small container deployed in very hot places, uh, we wanna mitigate or re reduce our thermal loads as much as possible so that we have less to mitigate. In addition to that, the container is painted with a product called Supertherm, which is a four-part ceramic coating and actually reflects four different wavelengths of light. So we get almost zero ambient heat gain from the sun. You know, the right-hand side where the panels and there are 30... Yeah, there's 32 panels on the right side on the bottom and on top of those are containers that have all the accessory parts to put it together. And right on top of the panels, you can see those tubes. Those are the support structure in the legs. So this is everything that you need in an eight by eight by eight connex that uh, can drop in. And we have some examples of what it powers a little bit later. But this is a really interesting setup because those 32 panels are put together on a framework that would best be described as an easy corner. If you've done an easy corner tent before or awning where you got um, poles and then you have the, the brackets that just screw it or tighten down with um, wing nuts and you can just assemble it. And uh, how quickly can you put it together from the container to up and running, Paul? So it was designed for two men or two people to be able to deploy it in under two hours. So from the time it hits the ground within two hours, everything is plug and play. Uh, there's an assembly procedure that's extremely simple and it goes up really quickly. And the reason we chose, uh, as you pointed out, it's actually EMT tubing and the fittings is because it's stuff that's available just about anywhere. Um, we're basically system integrators, so we, we don't like recreating the wheel if we don't have to. So we look for things that are easy to deploy, easy to use for other applications, and just put them into a different scenario. So let's take a look at the next image you have um, of the thing actually uh, being put out there to, to work. So you can see the easy corner, similar uh, setup there with the cube in the middle. Yeah, so that's at Burning Man for 2019. And in the background is a art installation called The Folly. Uh, we have a picture coming up that'll show what it's actually powering at nighttime. So there's a tremendous amount of lighting, huge sound system, um, all kinds of electrical loads that are all being powered by the power cube. So let's give the, the viewers an idea of how much power um, compared to like an electric vehicle, uh, Tesla or something, how many amp hours of battery would a Tesla have versus this? Well, the Tesla Model S and the Model X uh, comes with either a 75 or a 90 kilowatt hour battery system. We've got a, a Model X here at the ranch with a 90 kilowatt hour battery. The Power Cube uh, has a 50 kilowatt hour battery inside. So it, it's almost as large as the Model S with the 75. Um, it's actually about the same amount of power because it's lithium ferrous phosphate. We can discharge it all the way down to zero. So we can use the very bottom of that charge 
whereas typically you, you wouldn't go that deep with a uh, cobalt chemistry of lithium. Right. And so like for the example I use is a, an average house here in Hawaii with a lot of uh, electrical appliances would, would take about 30 kilowatt hours of power a day. So that's actually, this could, this one cube could easily run two houses for a whole day without ever having to be recharged, ever having to recharge a battery. So you could run two or three full, full on houses. And I'm talking houses with electric water heaters and everything uh, would be about 30 kilowatt hours. So a pretty heavy draw, two houses all day long, just on the battery power. And of course this is set up so it can charge the batteries uh, and give you that power day and night. So if you want to uh, give you a, a quick set of specs on the system, um, it comes with two configurations at the moment. So we have 50 kilowatt hours of energy storage. We have either eight or 12 kilowatts of inverted power. There are 15 or 18 kilowatts of solar panels. So it can power quite a bit of equipment. And the intent going forward is to create accessory modules in other eight foot containers that will allow us to pair different applications with the power cube, such as water purification, refrigeration, sanitation. These are all the things that are the first things to disappear in a disaster site. And without sanitation and refrigeration, medications spoil, uh, bacteria becomes a big issue. So it's, um, it's a very versatile system and we'll be thinking of other uses as we go along uh, for different applications. And, and of course, the, the real super advantage to this is after the first couple of hours, you're not searching for diesel fuel um, and, you know, having to scrounge fuel from someplace or compete with other needs like hospitals or um, wastewater treatment plants that need diesel power to back up their system. This system just uses solar power and you could probably even take some small wind turbines and couple them with this type of system and augment the power from the solar panels. Um, and use the energy storage in these uh, lithium ferrous phosphate batteries and really have some self-sustaining uh, emergency power where you're, you're not competing with anybody else for the energy. You're using the available renewable resources on site for an indefinite period. So this is, this is really a game changer for the emergency management folks. Another, another um, significant component to this, and you'll see it in one of the pictures, is communication. When crews arrive, uh, like from FEMA, when teams arrive on a disaster site, communication is absolutely critical and it's one of the things that goes down first. So you lose power, you lose communication. We had a satellite link um, and it, it can come configured with a satellite link so that you can immediately have communication for all the teams to be coordinated uh, as well as provide a wireless mesh um, for internet types of communication and, and data transfer. So we're gonna take a quick break now and uh, we'll be back in 60 seconds and show you some more images of the power cube in action at Burning Man. Hello, I'm Mufi Hanneman. I wanna tell you about a great show that appears on Think Tech Hawaii. It's all about tourism. In fact, we call it Tourism 101, where we talk about the issues and challenges that faces our number one industry throughout the state. We'll have some interesting guests very informative dialogue and allow you an opportunity to maybe learn a little bit more about why this industry is so important for our state. It's been great for us in the past, we need it today, and especially going forward. That's Tourism 101 on Think Tech Hawaii. Mahalo. Aloha, my name is Victoria and I'm a host at the Adventures in Small Business. This is a collaboration between U.S. Small Business Administration, Hawaii District Office, and its partners where we showcase the stories of local entrepreneurs and small businesses, talk about how to start a business, talk about great tips for small business owners. Uh, please join us every Thursday, 11 a.m. at Think Tech Hawaii. Um, see you soon. Mahalo. Hey, welcome back to Stan the Energy Man here on my new time slot, Tuesday at three. And we're uh, one of my favorite places in the world. In fact, I think God actually made this the Garden of Eden, but didn't want to tell anybody. But this is really a, a beautiful, beautiful place. 
And uh, if you can ever get over here to visit Paul, you really should try and do that. But, um, you know, we, we looked at this uh, power cube and the, the technical side of it. But, you know, a couple months ago, I had a, a gentleman, Professor um, ha uh, Hoggins, Nate Hoggins from uh, Minnesota, I believe. And he, he introduced me to a concept called energy blindness. And I, I think that people have really kind of lost track <clears throat> how much energy things use, whether it's their cars, their electric cars, their gasoline cars, or their houses. And that's why I, I use that 30 kilowatt hour analogy to talk about the batteries. But it's really hard to get the concept of how much power is put out by this cube if you don't have a good picture of, of what energy really costs and you're not energy blind. So that's why I asked Paul to go into a little bit more detail on that. So we've got some Im images coming up that really kind of bring that home. So I'll turn it back over to Paul. Yeah, so we have a slide at nighttime, a couple of slides at nighttime, showing what was actually being powered by the cube. So this is the art installation called the Folly. It, um, I don't have the exact number of lights, but it has a tremendous amount of lighting as well as sound systems, sound equipment. They even have a large windmill that is powered by an electric motor. And it kind of looks like a Dutch windmill, uh, just as a piece of, of mobile art. And uh, you can see right there that this is all being powered all night long uh, and they go all night until the sun comes back up. So the cube was taking care of all of this. I think there's another slide. Well, this is uh, showing the, the reverse engineering of alien technology. <laughs> actually, it's, uh, it, it doesn't take alien to actually operate this. It's extremely simple. In fact, it's pretty much automated completely, but it has all the controls built in to be able to control the system, log it, troubleshoot, do anything you need to, and even recover it from a black start uh, very easily. And only in Burning Man <laughs> when you get an alien with a NASA flight suit on. <laughs> so <laughs> I think there was another image, Robert, that um, showed the uh, cube in the desert during a dust storm or a sandstorm, which is, you know, that's, that's okay. the kind of environment that you'd, uh, you'd have a hard time generating power um, in an emergency. So what we, what we found was that just like at the Mars Hab, which is sometimes in the clouds, as long as the sun is actually shining, you get a lot of ambient scattered light and reflection off the particles. Now the powder at, at Black Rock is 10 times finer than talc. Um, this is actually just the beginning or very moderate dust storm. There are many times when visibility drops to within a few feet and you literally can't go anywhere. You have to stay still or be moving at a very slow pace so you don't walk into something. But even with the panels being covered up by this kind of dust, they were still able to actually charge uh, fully. And the wind loading conditions were one of the things we really wanted to test because it gets very windy. Uh, there were gusts of up to 60 miles an hour at times out there. And because the panels are flat, they're feathered into the wind, and none of the panels even moved. It, it really, really worked well with flying colors. So that's just shy of hurricane speed winds. So uh, hurricane speed winds start at 75 miles an hour. So uh, that's, that's pretty impressive. And, you know, Paul, that, the, the so, uh, lithium iron phosphate batteries are super. I've, I've, really admired them here, especially the fact that they don't have any thermal issues like lithium and cobalt. But, you know, our favorite topic is hydrogen. And could you pair this system uh, to use any um, basically curtailed power from your solar to make hydrogen for long-term storage? Yeah, absolutely. It's one of the accessory applications I forgot to mention earlier, but uh, one module or one cubed accessory could be an electrolyzer that could be producing fuel for either running equipment through fuel cells or actually using it as a cooking fuel for cooking or sterilizing instruments and, and water. Um, so there's definitely a, an application to use hydrogen in conjunction with this power source. Yeah, so even if you maxed out the batteries and they're fully charged and you still got daylight producing electricity from the solar panels, 
you could couple this with an electrolyzer to make hydrogen and use that stored hydrogen, like Paul says, for cooking, sterilization, uh, vehicles, if you have vehicles that run on hydrogen fuel cells, uh, all kind of applications. And really, we're, we're trying to encourage the grid here in Hawaii. Uh, we've got a, a goal of being off fossil fuels with our utility, uh, utility grid by 2045. And the reality is that by 2045, um, you can't just store all that energy in batteries. I mean, we have to realize that fossil fuels are very energy dense and we have millions of gallons of fuel stored up in tanks and to replace all that stored energy with hydrogen, it's, it's gonna take, a, or battery power even, you couldn't even do it with batteries. So we're looking at hydrogen to potentially store all that long-term and high power uh, energy. And uh, Paul, could you talk a little bit about the logic in that? Sure, this, this is one of the issues that is, seems to always be in discussion. And it tends to relate around the fact that hydrogen is less efficient round trip than batteries, which is actually true. However, you have to look at the big picture and what the actual application is. And if you're looking at storing energy for backup, and I'll give you an example with the military. The military has a mandate to achieve 14 days of autonomy. It means they need to be able to run for two weeks on their own stored power. Could they do it with batteries? Absolutely. You could store all that energy in batteries, but it would be actually ridiculous because of the cost. You'd be warehousing electrons for weeks or months at a time and not using them at a very expensive price. Hydrogen could do the same thing for literally half the cost, if not less, and four times the amount of energy in the same footprint as a battery. So it makes sense. And we have a kind of a corny saying that goes, there's no silver bullet, but there's silver buckshot. And it means we have to use everything available and use it where its application makes the most sense. So hydrogen and batteries, especially with them ferrous phosphate batteries, actually are the best pairing that you can come up with, I think. So the, the charts that I've seen from the national labs usually goes into the tens of megawatts um, of power or maybe a couple days of storage, you start to hit the max limit for battery storage. And after that, if you need to store energy for more than a couple days, or if you need to, to have power available for more than maybe 15 or 20 or 30 megawatts, you need to start looking at hydrogen um, energy storage. That's kind of the break even point or the switch over point. But the real trick um, for all these things, just like in the Burning Man application, is really balancing the storage you have, the battery power, the, the charging power, and what it's gonna be used for. And that's what I think is really remarkable about this cube, is that they packed a whole lot of power in a really small space. And it's, it's really just at that right spot where it's, it's for logistics people, it's in the right size container that can move quickly on container ships, it can be airdropped, it can be lifted in by helicopters, it can be put in there easily, and it produces a lot of power for the footprint. So I just think it's an amazing uh, piece of equipment, and I, and I hope that uh, it finds a, a good use in the emergency response area. Yeah, one of the other things that I didn't mention was that when the panels are all deployed, uh, it's possible to weatherproof those so that they actually become a rain shield. Um, and underneath those panels, you could actually close in the walls with tenting materials or other fabrics and be able to have a triage center or an emergency operating room um, or you name it. It, it. It's got so many varied applications and uses that we haven't even thought of um, one tenth of them at this point. So for example, we, this uh, ranch here that uh, Paul says has been off the grid for over six years is uh, another example of that cube, except expanded out to a much larger scale. And uh, they haven't had to use uh, any of their backup diesel unless they're working on equipment and they have to take something out of service. But it's pretty much been running the entire ranch here, which is how many buildings again, Paul? We have the equivalent of about 10 homes. If you looked at a, an average size house, uh, we're powering the loads for about 10 homes. So that it's, it's proven technology, including the hydrogen piece. They uh, store hydrogen at low pressure over here. 
and they're actually all set up for their uh, their, their next hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. Um, they're just waiting for it to show up on the Big Island so they can fill it full of hydrogen and uh, get it running around. So that way, uh, Hank Rogers will have something to drive besides his Tesla and keep it green. But um, Blue Planet does a, a lot of great research. Um, like I mentioned at the start of the show, we're actually sitting in the mission control for a lunar um, habitat that's run on Mauna Loa, the slopes of Mauna Loa, one of the big mountains here on the Big Island. And it's set up, uh, it was set up originally as a Mars habitat for NASA. And uh, Blue Planet was under contract with NASA for several years and had long-term um, folks living in that habitat, again, with the same kind of uh, lithium iron phosphate uh, storage, uh, energy storage and solar panels that uh, simulated life on Mars for months at a time. In fact, I think the longest mission was a whole year. And uh, that's the same kind of um, engineering that goes into what developed eventually into the cube, that kind of experience. So this isn't uh, something they just kind of thought up uh, over the weekend and went to Napa to get a bunch of uh, battery parts and throw it together. It's a really sophisticated piece of equipment, but very reliable and very useful, and very deployable. So, Paul, what's what's next on your project list? What what are you going to work on next? Well, we have a we have a a, a large list uh, that's prioritized uh, in in terms of importance. Uh, sometimes that list gets shuffled around, but one of the projects that's been on the list for a while, and we're going to step it up and focus on it in the near future, is to create a hydrogen stove that can be be deployed in third world countries, developing countries, where primarily they use wood or dung for cooking indoors. And they estimate about 2 million people die every year from cooking indoors with wood or dung. And not only do they pose health risk and health hazards, especially to the children, uh, it also wipes out the resources. They, they basically take all the wood that they can find just for cooking so it denudes the forest and creates all kinds of environmental issues. So if we can create a stove that can run off of a single solar panel, store that energy, create hydrogen with oxygen on demand, uh, that would replace the need for cooking with wood and it would be 100% healthy and safe and completely renewable. They'd only need a source of water at that point. So support Blue Planet especially Blue Planet Research here and uh, the work that they do. And we're looking forward, we'll, we'll have to come back here and visit Paul when they finally get that project underway and see, see what, uh, what they can do with that. I know that Hank Rogers uh, talked about it several times when uh, we were visiting with him and uh, it's really exciting stuff. So I wanna thank Paul and um, the folks here at Blue Planet Research and beautiful Puva on the Big Island. And uh, we look forward to coming back and visiting him again. And until next week, um, my new time, Tuesday at 3 p.m., I'd like to thank Paul, and thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you next week, Tuesday. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha.